Configuring a server's storage is usually one of the first tasks you need to perform on a new server. After finishing its initial configuration in the past, server storage was simply a disk controller and one or two hard drives. Now, advanced storage solutions are available to provide fault tolerance and high performance. In this video, we will cover the basics of server storage and then we will explain configuring local disks. With virtualization becoming such an important part of network communication, it is no surprise that Windows Server 2016 supports creating and mounting virtual disks. This video describes the basic steps to work with virtual disks. Once the storage is configured, you'll need to configure the storage for use, which often means sharing it with network users and setting permissions. This video discusses a variety of methods for creating and configuring Windows shares and show you how properly set permissions to allow users the proper access. Because many networks include Linux or Unix computers, you'll also learn how to configure network file system or NFS shares. One of the main reasons that networks and servers when invented was to have a centralized repository for shared files. The need for faster, bigger, and more reliable storage is growing as fast as the technology can keep up. Everything is stored on digital media now. Documents, emails, music, photographs, and videos. And this is, this is the trend that is continuing. In addition, people want instant, anywhere access to whatever it is they are storing. Just about every large internet company, from Dropbox to iCloud to OneDrive and many more, has its own version of cloud storage. Dozens of cloud storage services are competing to store your files. And although these services are convenient and seemingly work by magic, they all start with a server and some disk drives. This video will cover some basics of server storage what it is, why you need it, and the common methods for accessing storage. Generally speaking, storage is any digital media that data can be written to and retrieved from. Technically, this definition includes random access memory or RAM, but the term server storage generally means long-term storage. Maintaining data without a power source in the long-term storage is what we refer to it. Long-term storage includes the following type of media. USB memory stick or flash drive, secure digital or SD cards, and compact flash or CF cards, CDs and DVDs, magnetic tape, solid state drives, and hard disk drives. This discussion centers on server storage, which is based on hard disk drives or HDDs although solid-state drives or SDDs are catching up in popularity with HDDs, especially for applications requiring higher speed, smaller size, and lower power requirements, a solid-state drive or SDD uses flash memory and the same type of high-speed interface like SATA or SAS as traditional hard disks. An SSD has no moving parts, requires less power and is faster and more resistant to shock than an HDD. But the cost is still higher per gigabyte than of that an HDD. However, because of the speed advantages of SSDs, you'll often find them alongside HDDs in server systems. Most of the discussion of HDD also applies to SSD. And as the technology progresses and prices drop, you'll see SSDs eventually replace HDDs, except in the most storage-centric applications. Every computer needs some amount of storage, but servers generally require more than client computers because one of the server's main purpose is to store and serve files. The following list isn't exhaustive, but it covers most of the uses. 
operating system files. The operating system or OS itself requires a good bit of storage. The files that make up the OS include boot files, the kernel, device drivers, user interface files, and all the files for roles and features you can install. Together, they add up to around 9 gigabytes on a server with the graphical user interface installed and about 5 gigabytes in server core. Page file. A page file is used as virtual memory and to store dump data after a system crash. Its size varies depending on how much RAM is installed, memory use patterns, and other factors. In the past, the page file was set to 1.5 times the amount of installed memory, but this formula is no longer valid. By default, system manages the page file, which can change size depending on needs, but is typically close to the amount of installed RAM, up to 4 GB. Log files. The log files you see in Event Viewer and other log files change size dynamically depending on how the system is used. You can use Event Viewer to configure the maximum size of many files and that are stored as log files. Be aware that even if you aren't adding any files to the disk where Windows is installed, log files can slowly eat up disk space unless you keep an eye on them. Virtual Machines If the server is a virtualization server running Hyper-V, you need plenty of space to store files for virtual hard disks. Virtualization is one of the largest uses of disk space in the servers today. Database storage. If a server is running one or more databases, disk storage requirements vary depending on the size of database. Because databases can grow dynamically, it's a good idea to store them on a drive separate from Windows Drive, preferably on a volume that can have its own capacity expanded if need be. User Documents If a server is being used to store user files or user profiles, this purpose might be the largest use of the disk space. Using disk quotas on servers that store user files is a good idea to that a single user can't monopolize disk space by storing his or her entire collection of movies, for example, on a network server. When deciding how much disk space you need for a server, you should take all these uses into account. Remember that certain storage benefits from being on separate disk from the disk where Windows is installed. This advice is particularly true of the page file and virtual machines, but ideally, the Windows directory should be on a separate drive from most other storage uses. The discussion on storage access methods revolves around where storage is located in relation on the server. There are three broad categories of storage access methods. DAS, which is local storage and direct attached storage, NAS, which is the network attached storage, and SAN, which is a storage area network. Local storage has been around as long as computers have, but the interface to storage media have improved as the speed and capacity requirements have grown. Local storage can be defined as a storage media with a direct exclusive connection to the computer's system board through a disk controller. Local storage is almost always inside the computer's case, attached to disk controller via internal cables and powered by the computer's internal power supply. The term local storage usually refers to HDDs or SSDs instead of CD or DVDs or any other type of media. Local storage provides rapid and exclusive access to storage media through ever faster bus technologies. The downside of local storage is that only the system where it's installed has direct access to the storage media. Data on disks can be shared through networking and network file sharing, but the system 
with the installed storage must fulfill the request for the shared data. Direct attach the storage or DAS as a type of local storage and that it's connected directly to the server using it. In fact, DAS includes hard drives mounted inside the server case. However, DAS can also refer to one or more HDDs in an enclosure with its own power supply. In this case, the DAS device is connected to a server through an external bus interface such as eSATA or such. Small computer system interface SCSI was the older one that used to be used. USB, Firewire, or Fiber Channel are the other bus interfaces. A DAS device with its own enclosure and power supply can usually be configured as a disk array such as a RAID configuration. Although most DAS devices provide exclusive use to a single computer, some have multiple interfaces so that more than one computer can access the storage medium simultaneously. Most of the later discussions over here also applies to DAS devices because the computer usually sees an externally attached DAS device as a local storage. Network attached storage or NAS, sometimes referred to as a storage appliance, has an enclosure, a power supply, slots for multiple HDDs, a network interface, and a built-in operating system tailored for managing shared storage. NAS is designed to make access to shared files easy to set up and easy for users to access. Because NAS is typically dedicated to file sharing, it can be faster than a traditional server in performing this task. NAS shares files through standard network protocols, such as Server Message Block or SMB, Network File System or NFS, File Transfer Protocol or FTP. Some NAS devices can also be used as a DAS device because they often have USB, eSATA or other interfaces that can be attached directly to a computer. The most complex type of a storage is a storage area network or SAN. SAN uses high speed networking technologies to give servers fast access to large amount of shared disk storage. The storage that the SAN manages appears to the server as though it's typically attached to the server. However, it's connected to a high-speed network technology and can be shared by multiple servers. The most common network technologies used in SANS are Fiber Channel and ISCSI. These technologies are designed to connect large arrays of hard drive storages that servers can access and share. Client computers access shared data by contacting servers via the usual method, and the server retrieves the requested data from the SAN devices and pass it along to the client computer. SANs use the concept of logical unit number or LUN to identify a unit of storage. A loan is a logical reference point to a unit of storage that could refer to an entity array of disks, a single disk, or just part of a disk. To the server using the SAN, the loon is easier to work with because the server doesn't have to know how the storage is provided. It needs to know only how much it has available. SANs are often used by server clusters so that all cluster members have access to shared storage for the purpose of load balancing and fault tolerance. Let's look at this figure. This figure shows a SAN using fiber channel in which disk arrays are connected to a fiber channel switch and servers are connected to the fiber channel network as well as a traditional network. In this arrangement, all servers have access to the storage medium which can be shared and allocated as needed. Configuration of local disks can be divided into two broad categories, physical disk properties and logical disk properties. 
Physical disk properties, which must be considered first before purchasing disk drives for a server, involve disk capacity, physical speed, and the interface for attaching the disk into. Logical disk properties include its format and the properties or volumes created on it. Before you get too far into these properties, however, make sure you're clear on disk storage terminology. Disk drive. A disk drive is a physical component with a disk interface connector such as SATA or SAS and power connector. A mechanical disk drive, usually called an HDD, has one or more circular magnetic platters storing the data's actual bits and one or more read-write heads. One for each side of the magnetic platters, actually. The platters spin at high speed, and the read-write heads move from the inside of the platter to the outside to read data on the disk. An SSD has disk interface and power connectors, but has flash memory chips instead of magneting platters. And there are no read-write heads or other moving parts. Data on SSDs is accessed in a similar fashion as in a RAM. Volume. Before an OS can use a disk drive, a volume must be created on the drive. A volume is a logical unit of storage that can be formatted with a file system. A disk drive can contain one or more volumes of different sizes. Disk drive space that hasn't been assigned to a volume is said to be unallocated. Volumes can also span two or more disks in an arrangement called RAID. Volumes including RAID volumes are discussed in more details later in this video. Partition. This older term means the same thing as volume but is used with basic disks. The term partition is still used as times, but in Windows, it has already been replaced by volume. Formatting. Before an OS can use a volume, the volume must be formatted. Formatting prepares a disk with a file system used to organize and store files. These are different format standards, and the format you choose for a disk depends on how the disk will be used. The disk capacity you need depends entirely on how the disk will be used. Will it be a system disk for storing Windows operating system and related files? A file sharing disk? A disk storing a database? Or maybe one that stores virtual machines? Perhaps you plan to have combination of uses, but in general, a distinct type of data should be created on separate disks so that you can optimize some of the disk's logical properties for the type of data it will store. Keep in mind that you might not be basing disk capacity decisions on single disk because you could be configuring an array of disks in a RAID or using virtual disks with services like storage spaces. HDD capacities are now measured in hundreds of gigabytes with 4 terabytes and more being common. These days you can easily purchase a 10 terabyte disk in the market. Disk capacity is fairly inexpensive and having more than you need is better than having less. Here are some considerations for deciding how much disk capacity you need to buy when you need to get a disk. The Windows installation, the volume that stores the slash Windows folder. That volume should be on a separate disk from the data to be stored on the server. An SSD is a good candidate for the Windows installation. The page file should be on its own disk, if possible. An SSD is also a good candidate for the page file. If a separate disk is impractical, at least try to put the page file on its own volume. 
Take fault tolerance into account by using a rate, which combines multiple disks to make a single volume, so that data stored on a volume is maintained even if an individual disk fails. However, overall storage capacity will be diminished. The speed of HDDs is affected by a number of factors. The disk interface technology is an important performance factor that's discussed next. Other factors include rotation speed and the amount of cache memory installed. The rotation speed of disk platters in HDDs ranges from a low of about 4200 revolutions per minute to 15,000 RPM with the speeds of 7200 and 10,000 RPM in between. A server should be outfitted with an HDD that rotates at a minimum of 7200 RPM. But for high performance applications, look for 10,000 or 15,000 RPMs. The amount of cache in an HDD allows the drive to buffer read and write data locally, which speeds overall disk access. Cache sizes of 32 and 64 megabytes are common for server class drives but some very fast drives might have a little as 16 megabytes of cache. What you are most interested in for disk performance is how fast data can be read from and written to the disk and which data rate. When researching the disk for performance factors, look for sustained data rates that manufacturer claims. These tell you how fast a drive can transfer data from a point to another point. The disk interface connects a disk to a computer system, usually with some type of cable. The cable acts as a bus that carries data and command between the disk and the computer. The faster the bus, the faster the system can read from and write to the disk. The most common types of disk interfaces for locally attached disks are SATA, SAS, and SCSI. Each technology has advantages and disadvantages associated with it. SATA drives have replaced PETA drives and have several advantages over this older technology, including faster transfer times and a smaller cable size whereas the PETA interface is limited to about 167 megabytes per second, SATA drives boost transfer times up to 6 gigabits per second. SATA drives are inexpensive, fast, and fairly reliable. They're a good fit for both client computers and low-end servers. The SATA standard has evolved from SATA 1.0 supporting transfer speeds of 1.5 gigabits per second to the current SATA 3.2 supporting the speeds of up to 16 gigabits per second. However, most readily available devices support SATA 2.0 or SATA 3.0. Even with the, their high transfer speeds, SATA drives take a backseat to SAS drives in the enterprise server realm. SCSI drives were a mainstay in enterprise class servers for decades, and this drive technology has endured through more than half a dozen upgrades. The most recent SCSI variation developed in 2003 is Ultra 640 with up to 640 megabytes per second. SCSI is a parallel technology like PETA and has probably risked its performance limits. SCSI, however, has always provided high reliability and enterprise-level command features, such as error recovery and reporting. Its successor is a serial attached SCSI or SAS, which maintains the high reliability and advanced commands of SCSI and improves performance with transfer rates of up to 6 GB per second and higher speed on the way. SAS has the benefits of having bus compatibility with SATA, so SATA drives can be connected to SAS backplanes. A backplane is a connection system that
that uses a printed circuit board instead of traditional cables to carry signals. The SAS standard offers higher end features than SATA drives do. SAS drives usually have higher rotation speeds and use higher signaling voltages, which allow their use in server backplanes. Overall, SAS is considered the more enterprise ready disk interface technology, but enterprise features come with a price. SAS drives are also more expensive than SATA drives, as with many other things, server disk technologies have a trade off between performance and reliability versus price. Before data can be stored on a disk drive, space on the drive must be allocated to a volume. On a Windows system, each volume is typically assigned a drive letter, such as C, D, or A. A volume can use some or all of the space on an HDD, or a single volume can span multiple drives. Before you go further, there are two Microsoft-specific volume definitions you need to know. Boot volume. The boot volume is the volume where the Windows folder is located on. It's usually the C drive, but doesn't have to be. The boot volume is also called boot partition. System volume. The system volume contains file that the computer needs to find and load the Windows OS. In Windows 2008 and later, it's created automatically during installation if you're installing an OS for the first time on a system, and it's not assigned a drive letter, so you can't see it in File Explorer. You can, however, see it in the Disk Manager, as you can see over here, in earlier Windows versions, the system volume was usually the C drive. The system volume is also called the system partition. In Windows, the types of volumes you can create on a disk depends on how the disk is categorized. Windows defines two disk categories, which we're going to go ahead and discuss them right now. Basic disks. As the name implies, a basic disk can accommodate only basic volumes called simple volumes. A simple volume is a disk partition residing on only one disk. It can't span multiple disks or be used to create a RAID volume. The volumes on a disk are also called partitions. The disk management snap-in uses both terms in its interface but the term partition is more accurate and distinguishes it from the volume created on a dynamic disk. When Windows detects a new disk drive, it's initialized as a basic disk by default. You can create a maximum of four partitions on a disk. The first three you create with disk management are primary partitions. A primary partition can be an active partition and can be the Windows system volume. Primary partitions are usually assigned a drive letter but don't have to be as does the Windows system volume. If you create a fourth partition, it's called an extended partition, which can be divided into one or more logical drives, each assigned a drive letter. A logical drive on an extended partition can hold the boot volume, but it can hold the system volume because it can't be marked as active. If you need more than a simple volume, you must convert a basic disk to a dynamic disk. Volumes created on dynamic disks can span multiple disks and be configured for fault tolerance by using RAID. A dynamic disk can hold the Windows boot or system partition but only if you convert the disk to dynamic after Windows is already installed on the volume. You can create up to 128 volumes on a dynamic disk. To convert a basic disk to a dynamic disk in disk management, you simply need to right-click 
the disk and click convert to dynamic disk. Existing volumes on the basic disk are converted to simple volumes on the dynamic disk and all data on the disk is maintained. You can convert a dynamic disk to a basic disk in the same manner, but you must first delete existing volumes on the dynamic, on the dynamic disk and existing data will be lost. Windows offers two methods for partitioning disks. The most common method, or master boot record MBR, has been around since DOS. MBR partitions support volume sizes up to 2 terabytes. MBR-based disks are compatible with all Windows versions, as well as most other OSs. When a disk is initialized in disk management, it's initialized as an MBR disk by default. The second and newer method is GUID partitioning table or GPT. GPT disks became an option starting with Windows Server 2008 and Vista. They support volume sizes up to 18 exabytes, a million terabytes. However, Windows file system currently support volume sizes up to only 256 terabytes. Starting with Windows Server 2016, new disks are initialized using GPT, but you can select MBR if desired. In disk management, you can convert an MBR disk to GPT and vice versa, but you must delete existing partitions first. In addition to larger volume sizes, GPT partitions offer improved reliability in the form of partition table replication, a backup copy of the partition table actually, and cyclic redundancy check or CRC protection of the partition table. The storage space on disk drives is divided into sectors and sectors are combined by the file system into clusters when the disk is formatted. Sector sizes have traditionally been 512 bytes in length and the sectors are combined into cluster sizes in kilobytes of 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. Windows Server 2016 support disks with the 512 byte sectors referred to as a standard format disk, but Windows Server 2016 also supports advanced format disks that use 4096 byte sectors. The larger sector size allow windows to support much larger volume sizes than previously possible using 512 byte sectors. Windows Server 2016 also supports a hybrid version of advanced format disks called 512E drives in which the disk is configured with 4096 byte physical sectors but emulates 512 byte sectors to support systems that can't use 4096 byte sectors. You can view the sector sizes in use on a drive by typing fsutl fsinfo sector info which then it's going to give you a report over the disk. For example, as you can see on this slide, the logical sector size is as 512 bytes and the physical sector size as 4096 bytes. The command was run on a Hyper-V virtual machine indicating that Windows formats virtual disks using the larger size sectors but with 512 byte emulation. In general, if your server application requires very large volume containing large files, the advanced format disk is more efficient, but not all OSs support this type of disk. A basic disk supports only simple volumes, but you can create several volume types on a dynamic disk, including RAID volumes. RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks. RAID is a disk configuration that uses a space on multiple disks to form a single logical volume. Most RAID configurations offer fault tolerance and some enhanced performances. 
These are some of the types of volumes you can create on a Windows, Windows Server 2016 system. Simple volume. A simple volume, as mentioned, resides on a single disk, basic or dynamic. On a basic disk, a simple volume can be extended, made larger, if unallocated space is available on the disk. A simple volume can also be shrunk on basic or dynamic disks. A simple volume on a dynamic disk can be extended on the same disk or to multiple disks as long as they have unallocated space. A simple volume can also be made into a mirrored volume by using two dynamic disks. Spanned volume. A spanned volume extends across two or more physical disks. For example, a simple volume that has been extended to a second disk is a spanned volume. When the first disk has filled up, subsequent disks are used to store data. Spanned volume don't offer fault tolerance. If any disk fails, data on all disks is lost. There is also no performance advantage in using spanned volumes. Stripped volume. A stripped volume extends across two or more dynamic disks, but data is written to all disks in the volume equally. For example, if a 10 megabyte file is written to a stripped volume with two disks, five megabyte is written to each disk. A stripped volume can use from two to 32 disks. Stripped volumes don't offer fault tolerance but they do have a read and write performance advantage over expand and simple volumes because multiple disks can be accessed simultaneously to read and write files. A stripped volume is also referred to as a RAID 0 volume. The Windows system and boot volumes can't be on a stripped volume. Mirrored volume. A mirrored volume or a RAID 1 volume uses a space from two dynamic disks and provides fault tolerance. Data written to one disk is duplicated or mirrored to the second disk. If one disk fails, the other disk has a good copy of the data and the system can continue operating until the failed disk is replaced. The space used on both disks in a mirrored volume is the same. Mirrored volumes might have a disk read performance advantage, but they don't have a disk write performance advantage. RAID 5 volume. A RAID 5 volume uses a space from three or more dynamic disks and uses disk stripping with parity provide fault tolerance. When data is written, it's stripped across all but one of the disks in the volume. Parity information derived from the data is written to the remaining disk. The system alternates the disk that is used for parity information. So each disk has both data and parity information. Parity information is used to recreate lost data after a disk failure. A RAID 5 volume provides increased read performance, but write performance is decreased because of having to calculate and write parity information. The Windows system and boot volume can't be on a RAID 5 volume. Before you can store data on a volume, it must be formatted with a file system. Formatting creates the directory structure needed to organize files and store information about each file. The information stored about each file depends on the file system used. A file system defines the method and format an OS uses to store, locate, and retrieve files from electromagnetic storage devices. Windows supports three file systems for storing files on hard disks. File Allocation Table or FAT, New Technology File System or NTFS, and Resilient File System or REFS. NTFS is by far the most important 
and is dominant on Windows servers. However, FAT is still found occasionally on workstations and servers, and there are valid reasons to use this file system in certain circumstances. REFS, the comparatively new kid on the block, has limited features compared with NTFS. Before going into the detail on these disk formats, reviewing the components of a file system is helpful. Modern file systems have some or all of the following components. File naming conventions. All files stored on a disk are identified by name, and the file system defines rules for how to name a file. These rules include length, special characters that can be used, and case sensitivity. Hierarchical organization. Most file systems are organized as an inverted tree structure with the root of the tree at the top and folders or directories underneath acting as branches. A folder can be empty or contain a list of files and additional folders. In most file systems, folders or directories don't contain the data that make up the actual file. They contain information about the file along with a pointer to the file's location on the disk. Information for each file is usually called the directory entry. Data storage method. Space on hard disk is divided into one or more partitions with each partition containing its own file system. A partition is typically divided into 512 bytes sectors. The file system groups one or more sectors into blocks or clusters which are used as the basic unit of storage for file data. These blocks are indexed so that the file data they contain can be retrieved easily. A single file can occupy from one to many thousands of blocks. File systems vary in the methods they use for indexing and managing these blocks, which affect the efficiency and reliability of data storage and retrieval. Metadata. Metadata is information about a file beyond its name and the data it contains. This information is generally stored by the directory or folder with the file's name or in a data structure the directory entry points to. Metadata can include timestamps including when the file was created, last changed, and last accessed, descriptive information about the file that can be used in searches, file attributes, and access control lists. Attributes. Attributes are usually on-off settings, such as read-only, hidden, compressed, and so forth. File systems differ in attributes that can be applied to files and folders. Access control lists or ACLs. ACLs determine who can access a file or folder and what can be done with the file, such as read, write, delete, and so on. File systems vary in whether and how each component is used. Generally, more advanced file systems have flexible file managing rules, an efficient method of managing data storage, a considerable amount of metadata, advanced attributes, and ACLs. The FAT file system consists of two variations. FAT16 and FAT32. Although remember a third variation, FAT12, is the original version of FAT developed in the late 1970s. It was limited to use on floppy disks, and since those are obsolete, it doesn't exist anymore. FAT vaguely describes the structure used to manage data storage. FAT16, usually referred to simply as FAT, has been around since the mid-80s, which is one of its biggest strengths. It's well known and well supported by most of the operating systems. FAT32 arrived on the scene with the release of Windows 95 OSR2 in 19, 
96. The main difference between FAT16 and FAT32 is the size of disk partitions that can be formatted. FAT16 is limited to 2 GB partitions in most implementation, although Windows NT permits partitions up to 4 GB. FAT32 allows partitions up to 2 TB, however, in Windows 2000 and later, Microsoft limits them to 32 GB because the file system became noticeably slower and insufficient and inefficient with larger partition sizes. This 32 GB limitation applies only to creating partitions. Windows can read FAT32 partitions of any size. FAT16 supports a maximum file size of 2 GB and FAT32 supports files up to 4 GB. The number in FAT versions actually refers to the number of bits available to address disk clusters. FAT16 can address up to 2 to the power of 16 disk clusters, FAT32 2 to the power of 32, and so on and so forth. The number of disk clusters the file system can address is directly proportional to the largest size partition it supports. Already, you can see that FAT32 has severe limitations in current computing environment. The file size limitation alone prevents storing standard DVD images file into a FAT file system. The limitations are even more apparent when you consider reliability and security requirements of current operating systems. FAT doesn't support file and folder permissions for users and groups. So any user logging onto the computer with a FAT disk has full control almost over every file on the disk. In addition, FAT lacks support for encryption, file, decom uh, file compression, disk quotas, and reliability features such as transaction recovery and journaling, all of which NTFS actually supports. You might think FAT isn't good for much, especially compared with the more robust NTFS, but FAT and FAT32 still has their places. It's the only file system option when using older Windows operating systems, such as Windows 90-something. In addition, FAT is simple and has little overhead, so it's still the file system of choice on removable media, such as flash drives. For hard drives, however, particularly on Windows Server, NTSF, NTFS is usually the way to go, although some applications benefit from REFS. NTFS is a full-featured file system that Microsoft introduced with Windows NT in 1993. Since that time, its features have been expanded to help administrators gain control over anything that they need to do with the storages. NTFS has supported file and folder permissions almost since its inception, which was a considerable advantage over FAT. Many compelling features have been added, particularly starting with Windows 2000, you can see these features. Disk quotas enable administrators to limit the amount of disk space that user files can actually occupy on a disk volume. Starting with Windows Server 2008, quotas can also be specified for folders. Volume mount points make it possible to associate the root of a disk volume with a folder on an NTFS volume, thereby foregoing the need for a drive letter to access the volume. Shadow copies enable users to keep historical versions of files so that they can revert a file to an older version or restore an accidentally deleted file. File compression allows users to store documents in a compressed format without needing to run a compression-decompression program to store and retrieve the documents. Encrypting File System, or EFS, makes encrypted files inaccessible to everyone except the user who encrypted the file, including users 
who have been granted permission to the file. EFS protects files even if the disk is removed from the file system. Now it's time to talk about the resilient file system. The main uses of REFS is in large file sharing applications where volumes are managed by storage spaces and for storage of virtual disks. Although REFS is mostly backward compatible with NTFS, it doesn't support file compression, disk quotas, and EFS. Also, Windows can't be booted from an REFS volume, and the boot volume, the volume that contains the Windows folder, cannot be REFS formatted. REFS can repair minor problems with the file system automatically and supports volume sizes up to 1 utabyte, a trillion terabytes. REFS works with storage spaces and automatically can repair disk failure caused by corruption, whether from software or hardware problems. Unlike other fault-tolerant disk options, such as RAID 1 and RAID 5, that can only recover from failures, REFS can also correct some types of data corruption automatically. This capability, when used with the storage spaces, allows building highly reliable and scalable disk systems without using RAID disk controllers and, and sometimes wasteful disk allocation schemes that RAID configuration require. REFS has been enhanced in Windows Server 2016 and is now the disk format of choice for storing virtual hard disks for use in storage spaces and on Hyper-V servers. REFS is optimized for creating virtual disk files and moving blocks of data between files. For example, a fixed size virtual disk of 100 gigabytes can be created on an REFS volume in a little more than one second. The same operation on an NTFS volume can take several minutes. In addition, operations such as checkpoint merging and other Hyper-V specific storage operations perform much faster on REFS. Because of the features REFS doesn't support, this file system isn't intended as a replacement for NTFS. REFS is best for supporting applications that require virtual disks such as storage spaces in Hyper-V and on volumes for high availability applications that use very large files but don't require user-specific features such as disk quotas and EFS. Now that you know most of the options for local disk storage in Windows Server 2016, you can work through adding a disk to a working station. Depending on the system, you might be able to add a new HDD to a server while it's, pa it's powered on, a process called hot add or hot swap. Windows Server supports hot adding a hard disk as long as the server hardware supports it. Don't attempt to add a disk to a running server unless you know that the hardware supports it. After the HDD has been physically attached to the server and the server is running, you need to use the disk management snap-in or file in a storage services to make the disk accessible. By default, new disks must be initialized and brought online from their initial offline state. After the disk is online and initialized, you can create a volume and format it. In disk management, you can convert the disk to dynamic or between MBR and GPT partitioning schemes. Working with virtual disks. Virtual hard disks or VHDs are files stored on a physical disk drive that emulate a physical disk but have additional capabilities for virtual machines and general Windows storage applications. VHDs are used by virtual machines running in Hyper-V as the primary storage for the operating system and data. On a physical computer, Windows can mount VHD files and use them as though they were physical disk volumes. VHDs are also 
used in a storage of spaces applications to create flexible storage solutions. You might want to use virtual disks instead of physical volumes to store data. Virtual disks have the advantage of being very portable. Because a virtual disk is just a file on an existing physical volume, you can copy it to any location quickly and easily for the purpose of backing up data on the virtual disk or allowing it to be used by another computer. The disk management snap-in has options to create and mount virtual disks, and there are a number of PowerShell commandlets for working with virtual disks. Now it's time to talk about VHD and VHDX formats. When you create a virtual disk, you have the option to use the VHD for the VHDX format. The VHD format is the original format used by Hyper-V virtual machines. You may want to choose this format for backward compatibility with Windows Server 2008. However, for the most features, you should choose the VHDX format. Following is a list of differences between VHD and VHDX. VHD supports virtual disks up to 2 terabyte, whereas VHDX supports up to 64 terabyte virtual disks. VHDX uses a 4096 byte logical sector size compared to 512 byte sectors used in VHD. As mentioned, a larger sector size improves performance and increases the maximum disk and volume size. With VHDX disks, you can store custom metadata about the disk indicating information such as the OS version or the build number. VHDX is resilient to power failures because it tracks updates in the metadata, allowing incomplete writes to be backed out to avoid corruption. You can convert a VHD disk to VHDX using Hyper-V Manager or PowerShell. One of the benefits of using virtual disks is that they can be created as dynamically expanding or fixed size disks. A dynamically expanding disk takes up little space initially, typically less than 100 megabytes, depending on the maximum size of the disk, and then grows to the assigned maximum size as data is stored on it. When a fixed size disk is created, the entire size of the disk is allocated on the host volume. A fixed size disk provides better performance since the overhead of expanding the disk is removed and the fixed size disk will generally occupy contiguous clusters, reducing host disk fragmentation. For production environments that require the fastest disk performance, use fixed disks. But for testing and non-speed critical applications, use dynamic disks. And this concludes this video.